Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Newark Public Library Pride Program, Defend Trans Kids, the Fight for Trans Healthcare. I'd like to begin with an overview of this program so that you can know what to expect. We'll begin with introductions to our guest speakers. After introductions, we'll move on to a little background information and context about the anti-trans legislation that this program concerns. Following this context, I'll begin to ask our panel a number of questions on their areas of expertise. We will have time following these panel questions for some audience questions as well. At 6.20 p.m., each of our guest speakers will offer their closing remarks and we'll conclude the program from there. First, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Lena, the LGBTQ services librarian at Newark Public Library. I use both they, them, and she, her pronouns. Um, I've been working at NPL since 2019, but I've only recently entered the LGBTQ services position in the past couple months. If you attend other queer programming at the library, you probably see me there. Next, we have um, Michelle Della Piazza has been at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School since 2015, where she designed a novel required course for medical students titled Health, Equity and Social Justice, tackling timely issues in modern healthcare that aim to alleviate health disparities shaped by bias and social determinants. Her clinical efforts are focused on HIV prevention and treatment. She's the Associate Medical Director for the Infectious Diseases Practice, where she provides comprehensive primary care for people living with and affected by HIV. She's a co-investigator on numerous clinical trials focused on cutting edge HIV treatment and prevention efforts. In 2017, Dr. Dalla Piazza also led efforts to initiate a gender affirming transgender health program within the ID practice. The program focuses on achieving wellness and gender affirmation goals through primary medical care. Karen Greensmith is a thoughtful progressive policy attorney and advocate who specializes in providing support for bisexual and pansexual communities. From the White House to conferences across the country, they speak and write about the disparities facing LGBTQ people and how to remedy them through policy advocacy. Currently monitoring anti-LGBTQI rhetoric as a senior research analyst at Political Research Associates and teaching queerness and the law as an adjunct professor at Boston University School of Law, Heron has worked in progressive advocacy spaces for over a decade with the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, the Movement Advancement Project, Family Equality Council, and the National LGBTQ Task Force. Karen is a graduate of the University of New Hampshire and American University Washington College of Law. Karen is admitted to the New York and Massachusetts bars. They are a former board secretary of the Massachusetts LGBTQ Bar Association, a former board member of the National LGBT Bar Association, and a former Rockwood Leadership Institute fellow and a return Peace Corps volunteer. Sari Bensinov is a pediatrician. She is clinically proficient in all aspects of adolescent health care with clinical interests, including adolescent preventative care, adolescent gynecology, and sexual and reproductive health care. She's proficient in placement and removal of long-acting reversible contraception, IUD, and contraceptive implant. Additionally, she provides gender-affirming care for transgender youth and adolescents. She has a particular interest in medical education and is the co-director of the Community-Based Adolescent Medicine, CBAM rotation for residents and medical students. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with you. Um, so let's move on to some background and context so the people watching can know what this program is really about, the meat of it. Um, so we're still in the midst of a pandemic, the likes of which are unprecedented in our lifetimes. Over the past year and a half, there's been so much loss and so many new and challenging realities to accept, especially for children. To make things even more dire, trans children are being targeted specifically by aggressive laws restricting their ability to access the things they need to survive. There have been over 130 pieces of legislation targeting trans kids across 35 states so far in 2021. You can see by this map areas that are darker shades of red have greater numbers of anti-trans bills introduced. 
Vivian Topping, Director of Advocacy and Civic Engagement of the Equality Federation, which is a national coalition of state LGBT equality groups, was quoted on the surge of bills across the country, stating, the rise in attacks on transgender youth across the country is a coordinated attack. From anti-transgender youth sports bans, healthcare bans, bathroom bans, and now these guiding principles, the language is nearly identical from state to state. This is just the latest iteration of anti-LGBTQ opponents attack on transgender youth under the guise of protecting all children. Indeed, when looking through the text of specific bills, patterns emerge in the types of legislation proposed and the language used to propose it. You may be familiar with legislation restricting the right of trans people to use the public restrooms in which they're most safe. These laws imply the assumption that one can easily determine someone else's assigned sex at birth or other elements of their bodies, hormones, or medical histories in passing, when in reality, these are creating the ability for cisgender people to question others, both cis and trans, as to their membership in gendered spaces and to leverage the use of state violence to threaten them. Some other bills, such as one in Tennessee, would require anyone who provides gender neutral restrooms or changing rooms or defends the right of trans people to decide the safest restroom to use to post notice signs. While bathroom legislation has been a point of struggle for many marginalized people for much of this country's history, including trans people, but also houseless people and historically people of color as well, this new iteration of bathroom laws more often focuses on school bathrooms and locker rooms, zooming in on trans children rather than trans people of all ages. One of the most pervasive types of anti-trans legislation being pushed right now has to do with segregating school sports by a combination of sexed medical characteristics. The harm in these bills come from their enforcement, which requires a number of painful and potentially traumatic experiences undergone by children, including being misgendered by others and undergoing a non-medically necessary physical examination by an adult to determine their external sex organs. Some bills, such as one in Arizona, further punishes children's support networks by punishing school employees for allowing kids to play sports um, by cutting their funding. In fact, punishing adults who protect trans children seems to be a major theme in legislation in general. Legislation that restricts trans children's access to healthcare often includes extreme measures to punish care providers who work with trans kids, including revoking doctor's licenses. In some cases, like in Florida and Texas, helping a trans child to access gender affirmative care could result in doctors or parents facing criminal penalties. Some bills even seek to alter legislation defining child abuse to include helping one's child receive care within that definition. While some supportive parents are punished, some bills are also seemingly intended to leverage anti-trans sentiment among some trans children's parents to keep trans children from coming out at school. In Iowa, for example, there was a bill introduced which would have required teachers to out trans kids to their parents or guardians upon request. All across the country, there is this push to isolate trans children from any affirming adults in their lives. Even here in New Jersey, one of these bills was introduced in March, 2021. The text of the bill reads, this bill requires that participation in school sanctioned sports be based on biological sex at birth. It provides that public and non-public schools, as well as institutions of higher education, designate athletic or sports teams on the basis of biological sex. The bill also prohibits any athletic teams or sports designated for females, women, or girls from being open to males. In the event the sex of a student is disputed, the student will establish sex by presenting a signed physician statement that indicates the student's sex. They define sex as a physician's analysis of a child's reproductive anatomy, their endogenously produced testosterone and their genetic makeup. It's not specified what is to be done in instances when those factors do not align neatly in one or the other binary sex category for intersex children. You can see how this would disproportionately target marginalized children by relying on those in their school to single them out to dispute their sex leading to increased scrutiny of their body and identity. 
These acts are essentially a state sanctioned bullying process that involves their school, their doctor and their parents. One might also imagine the impact this sort of requirement would have on students who do not have health insurance and cannot afford these measures. All it would take to get a kid kicked off from playing school sports would be an accusation about their sexual characteristics. In 2017, Laverne Cox, an actress and trans advocate, explained the effect and underlying intention of bathroom restrictions, stating, when trans people can't access public bathrooms, we can't go to school effectively, go to work effectively, access healthcare facilities. It's about us existing in public space. And those who oppose trans people having access to the facilities consistent with how we identify know that all the things they claim don't actually happen. It's really about us not existing, about erasing trans people. The expansion of these restrictions from bathrooms to sports to adolescent health care, this continues this larger goal of materially harming transgender people. If a child cannot safely go to the bathroom, tell teachers their pronouns, join extracurricular activities, or seek needed health care, what does their life look like? You know, it looks like one of constant danger and isolation one of suppressing basic bodily needs, one of internalizing, demonizing narratives projected onto their bodies. In the Trevor Project's 2020 national survey on LGBTQ youth mental health, reflecting the experiences of over 40,000 LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 24 across the United States, found that 60% of trans and non-binary youth have reported engaging in self-harm in the last year, and over half have seriously considered suicide. It's worth noting that the number of trans youth who have considered suicide drops to only half the rate among trans people who report their identities are accepted. So we can understand a correlation between children's lack of acceptance and feeling hopeless enough to consider suicide. We can connect this wave of legislation to the danger to trans children's well being. In that same report, 86% of LGBTQ youth said that recent politics have affected their mental health. Now that we have an overview of the issue at hand, um, let's get into the details with some questions for our speakers. So, uh, sorry, in your bio for Rutgers, one of your areas of medical expertise is adolescent transgender health and gender affirming care. Would you please explain what that entails? What sorts of gender affirming care are trans minors seeking? Sure, thank you so much, first of all, Lena, for inviting me to speak with everybody today. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so I am an adolescent medicine physician and I'm a pediatrician. So I think first and foremost, when we think of healthcare and trans youth, we wanna think of access to healthcare and basically all healthcare should really be gender affirming, right? We wanna make sure our offices are a gender affirming space for respecting names, pronouns, um, and also patient privacy and parental consent needs and stuff like that as they, um, the patient's needs um, may warrant such things. Um, I think when people think of traditional gender affirming care, they hear the term gender affirming care. There's things that typically come to mind, but really I'm looking at things on a spectrum of care. Gender affirming care usually means exactly what it says, right? Any kind of health care, medical or mental health that's going to help the patient match the inside and the outside, right? How they feel on the inside and how people perceive them on the outside. And for some patients, it's maybe alleviation of symptoms, um, like an undesired menstrual bleed or something like that on one end. And the other end would actually be the initiation of cross-sex hormones to actually induce masculinizing or feminizing changes. It's very, very individualized to each patient. And it's a very extensive process where we have these conversations with the patient and the family of the patient are minors to help determine the best, um, the best care that the patient needs. Thank you. So this is a um, question for Michelle. Um, you're the director of a transgender health program um, within your infectious disease practice involving a multidisciplinary group of professionals. Among the trans healthcare services offered are mental health support, case management, HIV treatment and prevention and primary care for transgender and gender non-binary individuals, as well as things such as hormone replacement therapy. Something that I think many don't realize is that there is tremendous overlap in cis and trans healthcare and that trans healthcare needs are not an entirely separate experimental type of medicine. 
Um, this reality is even subtly acknowledged in bills intended to ban trans minors from accessing puberty blockers or hormone treatments, which specify that these treatments are only banned for reasons relating to gender dysphoria, not for any other reasons. So I was wondering, um, would you be able to speak to the uses of these treatments in cis medicine and how trans medicine and cis medicine overlap? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Not something that we talk about very much, but there is definitely overlap. I think one thing that's very um, important about our program is when we first started designing it, we asked our patients, um, in particular our transgender and non-binary patients, how they wanted that model of care to look. And of course, it included lots of things like uh, Dr. Bensianoff was talking about, sorry, I was talking about with respect to making sure that our spaces were inclusive and safe for people of all gender identities. Um, but it also meant not necessarily singling out trans people in a trans-specific space and a trans-specific time for a trans-specific type of care. It meant really um, integrating uh, people of all gender identities into our practice of care and making sure that what we were providing for our patients was primary care, right? The, the primary need was a, a model of primary care that was simultaneously gender affirming. And so that's what we've done. We have uh, we don't have a specific time or date or, or anything like that. Our patients are fully integrated into our practice. And um, one, you asked specifically about how these medications are used in cisgender care. And of course, there's very, um, there is a, a long track record of using hormones and androgen blockers and puberty blockers for cis people and intersex people um, for many years. And um, I do adult medicine, so I know a little bit less about puberty blockers, but I can go cut through some of the other type of adult treatments. It was interesting when I first started doing HIV primary care, I had to do a crash course in testosterone treatment um, because chronic viral infections can lead to what we call hypogonadism or low testosterone levels in cisgender men. And so I learned how to provide um, hormone replacement therapy in the form of testosterone for cis men who had very low testosterone levels. And this can lead to all, uh, a number of medical complications, including loss of muscle mass, profound fatigue, erectile dysfunction, and osteoporosis, which is thinning of the bones, which puts people at risk for fracture. Um, and so testosterone replacement plays a very important role for improving the quality of life and also preventing serious um, adverse outcomes related to low testosterone. Estrogens can be used for a number of different purposes, including um, the alleviation of symptoms related to menopause, um, for the treatment of primary ovarian failure in cisgender women. They can also be used in cisgender men for a treatment of advanced prostate cancer. We use topical formulations for the management of vaginal atrophy or dryness, especially in postmenopausal women. Um, and we use androgen box blockers for all types of purposes, including um, spironolactone, which is an androgen blocker that is one of the most important medications for the management of advanced heart failure and hypertension because it is a diuretic. Um, and then uh, other androgen blockers like finasteride, which are used for the treatment of enlarged prostate in cisgender men um, for the treatment of prostate cancers as well. So there, uh, and also for the prevention of um, Androgenic, androgenic balding. Um, so men use it uh, for that purpose to prevent scalp hair loss. So lots of different uh, varied uses for which we have a lot of experience and in cisgender and transgender patients, they're very safe treatments. Awesome, thank you so much. That's really helpful. So uh, this question um, is for Heron Greensmith. Uh, so in, February of this year, um, you wrote an article for Political Research Associates entitled New Anti-Trans Promise. An Ohio State legislator may have leaked a new set of anti-trans principles endorsed by three major anti-LGBT organizations. Um, I was hoping you would be able to discuss some of your research for that article and about what specific groups are involved in what Vivian Toppin called a coordinated attack. You know, talk about why these bills are all being introduced 
now at the same time? Um, who are writing these bills? Who are supporting them? Where is this surge coming from? I just shared in the chat, I'm not sure this is available um, in the Facebook group as well, but I'm happy to send it. It's just the website to promise to America's children. Um, so, you know, click with caution. This is a, this is a anti LGBT um, uh, coalitions website. So just understand that when you're clicking through. Um, so the promise to America's children is the latest iteration of how the evangelical right specifically is consolidating power and wealth in order to propose legislation that forwards their worldview, specifically their narrow Christian theological understanding of biological essentialism of the roles of men and women in the household and then the workplace um, of control of women's bodies, but everyone's bodies to um, control over children, emphasizing parental rights over the autonomy of children to make their own health care decisions about their own bodies. Um, and the Promise to America's Children is led by three of the main organizations at the head of the Evangelical Right Coalition. The Alliance Defending Freedom, which I'm sure you've heard about, is behind many of the, um, the uh, lawsuits around the country challenging um, uh, non-discrimination protections or asking for religious exemptions um, or forwarding um, uh, or, or supporting um, anti-trans uh, litigation. Um, and the Heritage Foundation, which is one of the premier right-wing think tanks and is also um, affiliated with the, the evangelical right, the Christian right. And then the Family Policy Alliance, which is one of the most deeply um, religiously entrenched of the three. Um, Family Policy Alliance is an organization that forwards um, uh, Christian right, evangelical right advocacy, um, and is also kind of a clearinghouse of the state Family Policy Alliances across the country. You probably have one in your own state um, that push for, um, again, narrowly theologically supported um, legislation and litigation to undermine abortion rights, undermine um, uh, children's autonomy, um, undermine sex education in schools, um, and undermine life and liberty for, for LGB folks. Um, the Promise to America's Children is a little bit different than usual because it's so open. Like they're upfront saying like, we have these 10 promises and these 10 promises to our children say, you know, they're being exposed to sexually explicit material and they shouldn't be, um, you know, having kids decide their own health care is dangerous. You know, girls shouldn't compete with boys in sports. It's just like straight up, boom, 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 boom. Here's 10 promises laying out our anti-abortion, anti-LGBT, anti-sexual education, um, anti-trans um, agenda. So the reason I say it's unusual is because these organizations always work in coalition. I mean, you can see it similar to like your LGBT community advocacy, right? Like many of us work in coalition explicitly, implicitly, we're always in conversation with each other. But, you know, when, for example, HRC and ACLU and the National Center for Lesbian Rights come together, you know, and like establish an initiative under a joint banner, it is significant. And, and this is similarly and analogously significant. So as far as who's writing the bills, this is really fascinating. Recently, the Promise to America's Children shared sample legislation on its website. But previous to about three weeks ago, it wasn't on there. And when you look textually at many of the bills, specifically the bills right now attacking trans health care, um, trans affirming health care for youth, they're not identical. They're not copy paste. And that actually frightens me more because that means this coalition is empowering individual legislators to write their own legislation, whether they're supported, you know, by the Alliance Defending Freedom, by the Policy, Family Policy Alliance, or by their, you know, their own state Family Policy Alliances, but they're writing their own. Um, and I am far more scared of a supported, energized, broad base of evangelical right activated legislators than I am of a top-down strategy where ADF is handing out legislation and people are filing it and supporting it. Um, so you have a combination now. You have a combination of legislators using the sample legislation and legislation similar to it that is offered through, family, for, through the Promise to America's Children, and you have a substantial portion of legislators who are writing their own legislation now. Well, thank you so much for all of that context. That's really valuable to think through. Um, I hope you don't mind. I have another question for you. <laughs> um, so 
Uh, obviously, anti-trans legislation is not a new phenomenon. Um, as we talk about pride, you know, in the midst of Pride Month, um, we remember that part of the police raid on Stonewall was due to enforcing laws requiring people to dress in clothing according to their assigned birth sex. Um, something that has struck me about this wave of anti-trans bills, though, is how much it seems to focus on children specifically. Um, would you be able to speak to why you think this tactic is being used? What about the political context of 2021 is leading to anti-trans rhetoric targeting minors? Yeah, I think that I think that we're not in a age that is surprising or specific in any way other than just um, you know, I, some sort of combination of Trump's losses plus a lot of the states having now tripartite Republican control of the House of the Senate and and the um, the uh, executive branch are, are allowing many of these bills to proliferate. But as I just wrote with my colleague Ben Lorber um, about the the intersections between transphobia and anti-Semitism, sparking fear of our children being attacked or recruited or in the case of really hardcore old school anti-Semitism and content note, I'm gonna about, about to say some like really anti-Semitic shit here, um, is the root, is blood libel. You know, the, the, the myth that Jewish people were literally killing Christian children and using their blood to cook matzah. You know, um, we are all concerned about children. We all hold children dear and are, are invested in, in making children's lives as full and safe as possible. So childhood will always be something that activates people, right? And, and, and activate, uh, you know, a portion of our brain that, that says, oh my gosh, something is, is, is hurting kids. Of course, I'm going to be against it, whatever it is. I mean, we can see the direct parallel in QAnon and Pizzagate, right? The, the myth that Hillary Clinton is, you know, a, a trafficker of, of child sex slaves, right? That she in fact has, I'm so sorry for this rhetoric. This is just my job, y'all. This is like what I live through. <laughs> that Hillary Clinton has like, you know, killed and cut the face off a child and then like just Gis whatever her last name is like wore the face like there's you know that is absurd that is absolutely absurd but there is a switch that gets activated when we talk about children um you know there's a reason why a lot of the most most recent to this iteration the state of anti-trans bathroom bills also centered around schools you know this myth that for some reason, people who don't who, who don't match the genitals of the people who should be in that bathroom is going to endanger the youth in that bathroom. So I, I also want to be clear that Alliance Defending Freedom specifically, their well, and the Heritage Foundation, their docket is huge. They are litigating and 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 supporting legislation that touch on all manner of things all of the time. And I do honestly believe that there is a level of throwing spaghetti against the wall, whatever sticks, throw your weight behind it, because that's going to be where the power consolidation is, that's going to be where the activation of the base is, that's going to be where the wealth building is. And right now in 2021, we have a rise in American anti-trans feminists. We have, you know, a similar rise and success with UK anti-trans feminists. We have the rise in Pizzagate, which is, and, and QAnon, which are bringing up threats to children and people's minds. Um, and of course, we have the attendant rise in the safety of trans people to be out, which cannot be ignored, but also cannot be used as a scapegoat. We can never use the visibility of a population to explain the pushback against that visibility because it's not pushback. It's entrenchment of a system of oppression that is reacting to visibility. This is not the fault of the people who don't have power suddenly becoming visible. That's like, you know, saying you got shot because you went out in the street. That's absolutely nonsense. Um, so for a lot of those reasons, you know, it is both completely logical and also somewhat of a crapshoot that children are the, the crux of the anti-trans legislation right now. Thank you so much. That analysis is really valuable. I'm so sorry for <laughs> what I have to say. No, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. 
So um, we'll bring it around to some lighter topics with, with medical things, yay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I was hoping that, um, you know, there's a lot of information and misinformation out there right now about puberty blockers, especially regarding their use um, in trans adolescent healthcare. I was wondering if you might explain what puberty blockers are, how they work, and your judgment as a medical professional as to their safety for trans minors. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question, Lena. Um, so as we kind of already talked about and Michelle had mentioned, puberty blockers have been around for a long time um, and they've been used um, within pediatric endocrinology for decades um, for the treatment of precocious puberty or basically early onset of puberty. Um, and for trans youth specifically, they're becoming very widely used to suppress puberty for various reasons. So puberty blockers, um, there's a few different brand names that are available on the market. They're primarily given as an injection, either a one month injection or three month, three month injection that's provided at the physician's office, or there's an implant that can actually be implanted right under the skin. Um, that can last for a year. So these are patients that are coming in frequently. They're coming into the physician for evaluation. Um, they're constantly having follow-up visits and they're being monitored to make sure one, that the medication is working, but then also that um, they're not having any kind of dangerous side effects related to the medication. When it comes to the use of puberty blockers in transgender youth, it's usually going to be prescribed by either a pediatric endocrinologist or an adolescent medicine physician. So someone who has a specialty um, and experience working with transgender youth. We cannot and do not initiate um, medical intervention, which in this case would be puberty blockers, until puberty physically starts. Um, so patients have to have the physical signs of the onset of puberty before doing any kind of medical intervention. And just for reference, um, the average, average age of onset of puberty in this country is 10 years old. So we're talking about an average age of 10, but that can vary a little bit. Um, patients are monitored very frequently. As I said, anywhere between one and three months, we're checking height and weight and making sure that they're growing appropriately. The advantage of putting youth on puberty blockers is traditionally what's said is to, you know, quote unquote, buy time. But it allows kids who, like I said, can be as young as nine or 10 to start to have cognitive and brain development where they can start to um, explore their gender identity and mature a little bit in order to make that informed consent decision whether or not they are ready to start um, HRT. Puberty blockers physically just pause puberty exactly where the child is when they start the medication. So they are not going to actually progress through puberty. So the advantages of that are that they're not going to have any of the secondary sexual characteristics that they may not desire because it doesn't align with their gender identity. Um, but of course, as you note on the slide, there definitely are risks and side effects that we have to monitor for. Um, the most serious side effect that we need to want monitor for is growth. Um, one of the most important things that happens during puberty is the growth spurt. And if people are on puberty blockers for too long, um, they actually may not, their bones may fuse. They may not actually go through the growth spurt that we need to go through. Um, the good news with puberty blockers is that they are completely 100% reversible. So once they're stopped, um, patients either will go through um, natal puberty, so the puberty assigned with the sex that they were assigned at birth, um, or the endocrinologist or the adolescent, adolescent physician is going to provide a puberty induction with HRT. And so they will get that growth spurt appropriately based on um, however they go through puberty. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for that explanation. That's excellent. Um, So um, this next question is for Michelle. Um, legislation across the country seeks to restrict available healthcare options for trans people, representing a change from what they are currently. So I was hoping that you might explain the current standards around accessing hormones, affirming surgeries or other trans healthcare in New Jersey right now. Um, what are the standards for getting that care? Yeah, um, a few years ago, there was actually legislation passed that um, protects uh, trans and non-binary folks from discrimination um, within uh, medical treatment related to gender identity. Um, and so uh, did that discrimination could, could include things like refusal of care or, um, or overt discrimination or abuse within the context of healthcare, but it also includes what uh, is required to be covered by insurance companies. And, and from our point of view, that's really very important. Um, and 
of course, we have uh, patients that have all different types of insurance. We have uninsured patients on uh, our hospital's charity care. We have patients with Medicaid, um, Medicare, uh, private insurance, employee based insurance, um, marketplace insurance. And so uh, what each individual insurance company covers might vary a little bit. But generally speaking, the things that must be covered under New Jersey state law and the things that we are successful in getting covered are any kind of hormone treatment, although um, certain insurance companies may have a preference for the type of hormone treatment that is based on um, either the formulation or the brand of those hormone formulations, although many hormone treatments have generic versions that um, are uh, on the the um, for formularies of the insurance companies. They also include things like chest masculinization, which is uh, required to be covered under the law in New Jersey. Chest feminization is not. Um, and so that is something that we often run into hurdles with insurance companies who may view that as more of a, um, a cosmetic procedure because hormones can achieve what they, they view as the same uh, the same end result, but we all know that that's not really accurate. Um, and then any, um, any surgeries uh, that we call bottom surgeries, um, so that would include things like phalloplasty, um, hysterectomy, oophorectomy, um, vaginoplasty, um, orchiectomy, these are all covered services um, under uh, New Jersey law, and we're usually able to get them covered by insurance companies, but it's not easy. Um, most insurance companies use the WPATH guidelines, so the WPATH is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and within those guidelines, they do recommend certain durations of uh, hormone treatment before bottom surgery in particular, and they also recommend um, letters from uh, mental health professionals and sometimes also primary care providers who are providing the hormones um, in order to confirm a diagnosis of gender dysphoria before approving the surgery. And so it's quite an onerous process. Thank you, I appreciate that context. So Heron, um, this next question is for you. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier on about, um, you know, my impression of this, that various types of anti-trans bills are working together to, you know, isolate trans children from support networks. Um, however, I'm sure that there's probably additional complexity or political rationale for the forwarding of so many bills specifically relating to sports and healthcare. And I was hoping you might be able to discuss the political relationship between these types of anti-trans bills and how they function together to achieve a larger goal of suppressing trans rights. Yeah, honestly, in my, in my personal opinion, Karen Greensmith's opinion, I think that the sports bills were random. I don't think that this coalition was prepared for this incredible success. Um, you know, they certainly could have suspected it, but you know, the, the initial kind of peek into the anti-trans sports area, other than just kind of like general bullshit and mis and disinformation, was the Selena Soul case, um, uh, which uh, I believe began in 2019 um, when uh, a couple of cis uh, track runners in Connecticut and their mothers. Um, sued the uh, Department of Education um, for, sued the state of Connecticut, and then the Department of Education became involved for its non-discrimination provisions that explicitly permit, as is appropriate under Title IX, the federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, um, and now under Bostock, an, a, a appropriate interpretation would be to include sexual orientation and gender identity in places of public accommodation. I mean, in place of education, including sports um, in all federally funded and federally touching programs. So rightfully so the Connecticut, I think high school athletics association permitted trans students to compete in sports. Um, and Selena Soul and um, her classmates and her and their mothers sued um, because it doesn't actually matter why they sued. What matters is the larger context in which you had two or three um, conventionally attractive high school girls saying that they had been hurt by trans people who not coincidentally were black trans 
feminine girls. And these Selena Soul and her and her compatriots were comfortable talking with concerned women for America, talking with the Alliance Defending Freedom, talking with Family Policy Alliance, making videos with anti-trans feminists in which their beauty, their traditional beauty is deliberately juxtaposed against the Black trans girls whose beauty goes against the norms of Eurocentric Christian right, you know, white supremacist, white nationalist ideals. I know, I know that what I'm saying can sound a little bit out there, but my job is to look at systems, is to look at how oppressive systems interlock with one another, and we cannot escape how white supremacy and white beauty ideals impact how we talk about trans people and how we talk about the rights of cisgender people to excel in specific instances at the expense of trans people's lives, very truly their lives. We have black trans women, other trans women of color being murdered at a rate unprecedented in this country this year. And when you have these white, I'm not sure that all of them identify as white, these, these thin, beautiful girls saying, I was hurt by these people who they place in juxtaposition, you have an, like, an immediate spark for people who perpetuate patriarchal ideas, who perpetuate white supremacism, who perpetuate male supremacy. And so with a bunch of these organizations at the back of this litigation, we had bills proposed across the country and a lot of these are spontaneous and then replicated. So for example, um, I can't remember the legislature's legislator's name in um, Idaho, which passed the, the first sports ban, um, but she spoke very openly about how she was like super like impressed by these girls and like wanted to protect them and wrote legislation and reached out to ADF in order to write it. Like it is so transparent. Um, the, the, if not the purpose behind the bill, and I say that because one of my tenants at work is when someone tells you what they believe, you believe them until they show otherwise. I believe that these people believe they need to protect girls sports. I believe them, but what they're showing me is they don't actually give two shits because what's threatening women's sports right now is underfunding is poor facilities and is rampant sexual abuse within girls and women's sports. I mean, we all saw, you know, Simone Biles's um, conversation about why she came back to Olympics because she wanted to show that you can be a survivor of sexual abuse and succeed. There is no problem of trans people competing with cis people in sports at all. So to come around and answer your question, the relationship is, as always, the systems of oppression that impact us all. They are the patriarchy and Christian supremacy and white supremacy and racism that are working together to allow this like gunpowder trail of anti-trans sports bills across the country flare up and explode this powder keg of whiteness, this powder keg of, you know, white irrelevance that some conservative white people and some evangelical right white people are feeling right now. I'm sorry, I tend to like go very cerebral <laughs> questions like this. I hope that's helpful. I appreciate it a lot. I mean, as you said, there are all of these interconnecting systems. And, you know, I think it is important when we're talking about the reasons why these things happen, because it does involve all of these systems you know, always coming together in, you know, intersecting ways. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so this next question is for Michelle. Um, I wanted to talk a lot of the justification for anti-trans bills relating to both sports and healthcare often rely on these very binary and essentialist understandings of the hormones, testosterone and estrogen. Um, these hormones, which of course are present in varying amounts in every human body, often carry a lot of symbolic cultural weight with all sorts of social gender roles attributed to them to the point that some people even mistakenly think that cisgender women 
don't naturally produce testosterone or that cisgender men don't naturally produce estrogen. Um, so I was hoping that you would be able to explain um, from a medical perspective what these hormones are, what effects they have on bodies, and to address some of the common misconceptions and myths surrounding them that you've encountered. Yeah, um, that's a that's a, a big question. <laughs> but um, when it comes down to what are these, they are very much uh, very sim biosimilar um, chemicals, um, basically. Um, and I think what's really very fascinating is that as we learn about how um, the gonads uh, develop in um, in utero um, and then through early life and childhood, is that there there really there really are just very subtle differences in the development that um, lead to what we think of as what would be typical um, sex development for uh, males and typical sex development for females. Um, but at the same time, as we know, you know, it's not, it's not really very binary at all. Um, and we often, there's a whole invisible population, the intersex population, whose sex development is not typical of what we think of classically male or female. Um, and um, there are a number of uh, differences in sexual development that have been described, and some are related to hormones and some are more anatomic. I think what we're still trying to understand is um, how sex hormones affect the development of the brain and how they might relate to behavior. But I think that generally speaking, what we're learning about the effect of sex hormones on brain de de development and behavior is that we have overemphasized it to a great degree. And so much of gender development really is in the brain. Um, and it is so much of it is totally independent of the effect and influence of sex hormones. Um, and I think this has been very well documented in a lot of really interesting um, articles. There's also this really interesting um, NPR, uh, uh, I think it's the TED Radio Hour, where they kind of talk about misconceptions around testosterone and estradiol um, and their biological effects and their effect on brain development and behavior. Um, and they kind of talk about where those misconceptions come from, um, including you know, outdated and really weird ideas that people had before they really understood sex biology. Um, and uh, it's a really, so if you have a chance to listen to it, I, I would listen to it. It's a TED Radio Hour. TED Radio Hour, and I think it's called The Biology of Sex or, or something like that. Um, but it's a really fascinating, um, a fascinating talk. And I think the bottom line is that, that we still have so much to learn. And to think that medicine or uh, science has it all figured out. Um, and I think people refer to that a lot, you know, oh, but we, all, we have it all figured out. This is done, done deal. This is done science. We definitely do not. There's so much that we don't understand. And erasing trans lives and trans experiences and trans existence by pretending that science doesn't support their existence is, um, is it's incredibly harmful, <laughs> obviously. And I think that's what this, this is all coming around to, right? And I think there are questions you're gonna ask and I think the other panelists will talk to this too. You know, How does this affect our patients, this type of legislation, hearing about this legislation? It erases them, it harms them, it kills them. And so I, every time I hear about this type of you know, legislation or these types of ideas, I, it, it, it boggles my mind. I have a, such a hard time wrapping my mind around it as a physician, as a human being and understanding why there is legislation out there that is aimed to harm. You know, I, I read this wonderful article by Ibram X. Kendi where he talked about, you know, you know, legislation and policies that want to protect people's right to harm others and legislation and policies that, policies that want to protect people from harm. And there, there is a, there's a very clear line um, that you can see in these are policies that are meant to harm people. And it, it's, it really is about life or death. I, I can't emphasize that, that more. Thank you so much. So, um, sorry, I, I think an important part of cutting through the misinformation and kind of fear mongering of 
you know, relating to trans adolescent healthcare is to talk about the reality of what this healthcare really looks like. Um, so for this question, I'm interested um, if you would be willing to share your personal experience as a healthcare provider who does work with trans youth in New Jersey. Um, what's the age range of trans minors that you work with and how do you help them make the best decisions they can about their bodies? Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll start. I agree with many of the things that, um, you know, Michelle was saying about the harms that we're seeing to our patients. And, you know, Lena, as you pointed out earlier, you know, we're having this conversation in the midst of COVID, which has really led to a huge mental health crisis, one among youth, um, also among marginalized communities, including the transgender community. Um, and as an adolescent medicine physician, I'm taking care of adolescents that also identify as transgender. So it's been a very challenging, challenging year. Um, and this onslaught of legislation has really, um, I think made all of our jobs a lot, a lot harder. Um, you know, I think when you talk about the age range of trans youth that come in to see me, I'm a pediatrician, so I see anybody um, that walks in the door. Gender development and the development of gender identity has been described as early as four to five. And so it's not uncommon for children to try to, or to start to explore this um, at these young ages. And parents may often have questions. A lot of those questions are very much directed at the pediatrician, which makes sense. And a lot of those pediatricians may not know how to answer. Um, those questions. And so even though my specialty is adolescent medicine, I welcome anyone in the door that has questions about gender exploration, gender identity, even as young as four or five, because I think it's very important at those young ages um, to support the parents and then answer their questions, because they probably have a lot. If you can provide support to the parents and help the parents get support through other communities of other parents, and they'll be able to help their child, and the number one protective factor against um, trans youth suicide, trans youth mental health is supportive families. And so I think one of the most important things that we can do is to support the family so that they in turn can support um, the young person in their lives um, that's exploring um, who they are um, and how they identify. Um, and I think that kind of leads into the second question that you're asking, right? I think, how do we help them? I don't necessarily think that I help them. Um, because a lot of times I'm sitting there and I'm asking these open-ended questions and I'm just giving them a place, a safe place, I think, for them to talk and explore how they feel, giving them privacy. But as in the case when we're talking to minors, I think parents very much need to be involved in the conversation. And many young people are lucky enough to have supportive families and many young people, unfortunately, are not that lucky and don't have supportive families. And the conversation definitely is going to vary based on um, who the supportive people in their lives are and where we can connect them and get them into other supportive places if their family is or they need help beyond their family. Because I think there's um, it's really important to have peer support in addition to family support um, as well. Um, as far as like medical things, you know, we're having, this is a conversation that's constantly evolving. Um, every time I see a patient, we're talking about, you know, how they identify, how they feel, what they want out of their health care, whether it's primary care, reproductive health care, gender affirming care, whatever they need. And the conversation is always being done over and over again. Youth are not just developing physically, they're developing emotionally, cognitively, um, and socially. And I think working with their developmental stage as patients get older and readdressing um, this informed consent decision making in a developmentally appropriate way is the way that we help them move forward with their health care medical and mental health, because I think it's important to address the mental health as well. Thank you so much. That's a really lovely answer. <laughs> um, so uh, Heron, you touched on this a little bit um, earlier, but I'm, I'm hoping uh, that you'll be able to speak to it more specifically. Um, you know, in reading through the text of some of the bills, um, when I was doing research for this program, especially those relating to sports, but also some relating to bathroom policies, et cetera. Um, a lot of them target trans girls specifically. And so I was hoping you could speak to the role of trans misogyny in these laws. Um, and I also wanted to tie in, I know you've written previously about trans exclusionary radical feminist partnerships with the far right um, in articles such as A Room of Their Own. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain, you know, how trans girls have been targeted by this coalition of, you know, this particular strand of, you know, trans exclusionary radical feminism and the far right and Christian right. 
Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's so complicated, but at, at, at the root of it is obviously patriarchy and the patriarchy incentivizing everyone to police gender so that none of us can ever meet the ideal and so that we can all be punished to certain levels, right? A system of oppression oppresses people and patriarchy is one of the most effective systems of oppression. And within a system of oppression, no matter how much we resist and think that we're not replicating the system, we are. So we all internally and externally police our gender and everyone else's gender around us. We make assumptions about people. We judge people's, you know, uh, fit for specific situations based on patriarchal ideals that have been instilled in us since birth. And there is a, um, you know, uh, woven into the patriarchy is an incentive to create an ideal woman that none of us ad adhere to, right? I mean, I'm a non-binary person and, you know, I still hold myself to, and I know others hold me to, you know, uh, to contrast me with this ideal woman. Um, and so, you know, trans misogyny operates even invidi more invidiously than, you know, misogyny on cis women, or I should say in, in, in different ways to say essentially that trans women aren't women. You know, I try and avoid the, user, the, 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 the term real women because there are no real women. The, the real woman doesn't exist. Women exist. All women are real, but I try to avoid the word real because it sets up this idea that you need to be a certain level of trans in order to be a real woman, right? And that's just another gatekeep, a gatekeeping of what is transness, of what is transition, you know? And of course that opens all these ideas of classism and access to healthcare, you know? And of course, you know, living in a world outside of these laws, right? Which is literally putting barriers between people accessing an identity. Like, I can't say I'm trans, I can't access care I need, therefore, am I not a trans person? So, you know, I, I say it's a little bit more complicated because, yes, trans girls are being targeted by the sports bills, and that is because the sports bills are being phrased as girls being the victims. So girls as this thing being harmed, trans girls as the harmer, and then the anti-trans healthcare bills are actually motivated also by harm to people who the legislators think of as cis girls. When in fact they are, you know, a combination of some cis girls who are gender non-conforming, you know, some non-binary youth and some trans boys, right? This idea that the trans people are recruiting cis girls, again, the cis girls are the victims here and the trans people are the harmers. So in both of these contexts, cis girls being harmed is at the center of the argument. And then trans people are on the outside, you know, either stealing children from, you know, their cradles and like transing them, you know, or like beating them in sports and robbing them of their metal, precious medals, or in the case of Selena Soul, their precious seventh places when they got eighth place instead, because petty alert, she wasn't even gonna win. But that's just, who am I to say that? I'm not a runner. Um, so, you know, and then of course, if we even reduce even further, protectionism of cis girls is paternal patriarchy, right? This idea that cis girls are a, you know, pure flower that needs to be protected. And if they are corrupted in any way, you know, they, they, they will, the entire, white family universe will fall apart and will be overrun by, you know, and then insert whatever racist, you know, um, uh, in, in my, you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric you want there. But at the core of patriarchy and white supremacy is the preservation of the white cis girl who is yet to have sex with anyone, but who will have sex with a cis man soon. And we better keep her that way so that when we have sex with her, it'll be perfect and we can have a perfect white baby. Again, I know I sound so cerebral and so weird, but this is truly at the heart of these anti-trans advocacy 
pushes the preservation of the white cis girl. And that is, and, and from that spiral out racism and trans misogyny until you have this like whirlwind of, of violence um, and harm. Thank you so much. Uh, so for our concluding thoughts, um, I was hoping that each of you um, might give your uh, closing thoughts for um, what can people who are watching this, um, what can you know, us adults do um, right now to defend trans kids? You know, what do you suggest um, to help the trans kids in our lives, um, to help the trans kids in our communities? Um, what would you recommend for someone to do right now? Well, I, I can start. I can just say that that support for trans kids and trans people in general is very critical. I think Sarah and I both see when that support is absent in someone's lives and how that detrimentally affects their trajectory in life. Um, so we've both seen patients who um, don't have a place to go, don't have a place to live, have been uh, experienced familial rejection. Uh, bullying, um, abuse, sexual assault, um, uh, discrimination in all walks of life, including healthcare, and um, and, it, and it's it's just uh, overwhelming um, sometimes um, in hearing the patients and their trauma stories. And but when you have someone who is supported by friends and family, they feel that they have a community and a community that they can rely on, it makes a world of difference. And it's made a world of difference in the context of the COVID pandemic, for sure, which has really um, led to a lot of precarity among many marginalized patient populations, like Sarah was talking about before. Um, and so, uh, you know, beyond being tolerant, beyond being accepting, like really um, being um, completely you know, creating spaces that create a sense of belonging for everyone is really critically important. Beyond that, I think, and I know that Sari and, and Harold will talk more about this, but advocacy is, is critically important. As physicians, as humans, as lawyers, as, uh, you know, librarians, we, we, we have to take on this role of advocacy and speaking out on behalf of our patients. It's really, I'm so glad that you invited us to this today to kind of really be able to talk about this. Once, I wish, I wish I could just like have someone live a day in my life and see the transformation that people go through when they finally feel heard, they feel like they belong in this healthcare space and they get the treatments that they need to align their bodies with their identity. The transformation is spiritual, emotional, mental, physical, like everything you could possibly imagine to it from a state of, dysphoria, potentially anxiety to a state of thriving happiness and wellness. And I, I really I hope that more people will, will hear these stories to understand that being trans is not about suffering, it's about happiness, it's about thriving, it's about um, really um, being your true self. Um, so I guess I will follow that, although that's a very tough act to follow, Michelle. So thank you very much for your passion there. It was um, really wonderful to hear that. I agree. Um, you know, taking care of, I think, my patients is really a privilege. Um, I don't know if I'm really going to answer your question, Lena, but I am going to say um, I was giving a presentation recently um, and I found a study. It was actually just published in the Journal of Pediatrics um, and it was done among high school students in Pittsburgh. And they basically tried to quantify the amount of students, high school students that identify as transgender. And the number based on how the survey was done, the number that they came up with was about nine to 10%, which is much, much higher than a lot of the population surveys that we're seeing now. So of course, this is not the end all be all. We're not saying nine to 10% of high school students nationally are transgender, but I think what the article is trying to show is that younger patients, minors, youth um, are really stepping outside of this binary, um, even trans male, trans female, trans masculine, trans feminine. And I think we all have young people in our lives that may not identify within one of these binaries. And I think when we think about how to live our lives, how to support trans kids, I mean, advocacy is so important in our professional lives and how we support trans people is very important as well. But creating a space among the youth that you interact with on a regular basis where we're not, um, you know, 
putting people in the binary or forcing pronouns on them that are making assumptions about people's pronouns, um, allowing people to kind of express who they are, because I think that this is going to be, this is the future of how people are exploring and expressing their gender, their gender identity. Um, and I, I'm really excited to see how it transforms as these people, um, as individuals become older, um, and this hopefully becomes more mainstream and we don't need to put people into silos. Um, we have to resist misinformation and disinformation. I'll just have like a really tight to do, which is just make sure that you are following the um, advocacy of the, the major medical associations in the country, all of which affirm the efficacy um, and safety of trans-affirming care for youth and for adults. Media Matters did an incredible survey of 2020 Facebook um, posts and found that the conversation around trans lives, all trans issues, was dominated by right-wing media, like 75%, something not even close to proportionate. And that that 75% was dominated by four or five or six outlets. So this is what people are seeing. People are not seeing, you know, left or even you know centrist conversations media reportage around trans lives people are seeing over and over and over again the right-wing media's replication of anti-trans talking points and the mis and disinformation that these organizations and the small anti-trans medical organizations who back them are shilling we need to get far better at understanding and criticizing mis and disinformation, knowing when we're being duped, you know, not falling for um, the the idle conversations of like, but what about you know when people's bodies are different in sports? Like, come on, people, we need to be able to say like, actually, tons of different people compete in sports, and it's never mattered, you know, like what bodies are. Some bodies excel at some sports, and some bodies excel at others. Like, we need to have a better, quicker response to the mis and disinformation that we are being pumped constantly. So please follow Political Research Associates. We research all areas of the right. You know, we hopefully arm you with how to combat mis and disinformation, but we have a crisis in the United States right now around social media replication of just absolute nonsense bullshit. And I hope that we can learn to better resist it. Awesome. <laughs> all, of, all of your answers were so amazing. And, um, and yeah, thank you all so so much you all contributed such vital perspectives and thoughtful answers um, on this topic and um and thank you all so much for your time and your energy um in the fight for trans health care um thank everyone who is attending for attending um and i hope we can all uh go forward from this and defend the trans children who are relying on us adults to build a safe world for them to grow up in um, so I encourage everyone watching to keep researching, keep learning, and listen to trans people about what they need to not only survive, but to thrive in this life. Um, take care, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>